When Nick Kiprios played in the National Hockey League, he was never among the best players on the four different teams on which he played. But he did play 442 games in the NHL, becoming one of the infinitesimal percentage of kids born in Ontario to have that dream come true. It's also fair to say that Kiprios's career will always be remembered for the way it ended, which was shocking and brutal. It's all in his new book, Undrafted, Hockey, Family, and What It Takes to Be a Pro. And we're delighted to welcome to TVO from North Toronto, the guy everybody calls Kipper. Kipper, it's so good to have you on TVO. How are you? I'm well, Stephen. Thanks uh, for having me. And I think uh, we, we've had a couple opportunities to talk, but uh, earlier in a career uh, evolved around the business side, the CBA, not so much fun. Exactly. It's good to have you here talking about your career. And I want to start with, with the kind of player you were in junior versus the kind of player you turned out to be in the National Hockey League. Because I, I wrote these numbers down because I, I was fascinated by it. You're playing in North Bay. You get 62 goals in 64 games. Another year, 49 goals in 46 games. These are phenomenal numbers. You are a big-time goal scorer. And then you get to the NHL, and it's not so much about the scoring anymore. You're one of the tough guys on the team. How and why did that transition happen? Yeah, that was a, it was a conscious uh, uh, effort on my part to kind of read the tea leaves. The one thing that I do know, uh, Stephen, that they're not patient people in the NHL. They'll give you a small window to score goals, and if you don't, then you move on, unless you're a first pick, and that that puts a lot of pressure on the scouts to uh, to show your organization uh, that you made the right choice. So you get a longer leash to try to score goals. But Washington wasn't very patient with me, and I had a small window to score goals. It didn't happen, but I wanted to stay in the lineup, so I made the conscious effort to find other ways to contribute. Even all those junior years, Stephen, I was – I was scoring goals. I, I like the physical aspect of the game. I hit a lot, and on occasion, I would fight. So it was just a real conscious effort for me to go out there and do that more at the pro level. Well, your level of commitment to stay in this game is perhaps best exemplified in the next story that I'm going to ask you to tell. You're at this moment with the American Hockey League Hershey Bears. Someone clips you across the face with a stick cutting your lip wide open for more stitches than your doctor can even remember. you got five broken teeth as well. You spend all night long in a dentist's chair going through root canal as he tries to <laughs> fix your mouth. Two days later, you are back in the lineup with a face shield on, ready to play. And I want to know whether there was a little voice inside you, Nick, that at some point said, geez, this may not be such a good idea for my health. Was that voice there? Yes, it was there. What the hell am I doing here? Is anybody even watching? Does anybody even care? How close am I to the NHL? I'm not. I can't even stay in the lineup regularly. And to go back in that lineup uh, so quickly after my five root canals uh, a couple of nights before just showed me what the pro level is all about in terms of do it now or don't get that second chance. So they still had to decide whether or not I was a good enough player in the American Hockey League. Forget about thinking about playing in the NHL. So I had to go in there and ultimately show them uh, that I am worthy to be a, a good player in the American Hockey League. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. And from that injury, I ended up getting sent back or at least making the decision to go back to my junior team as an overage year to try to build my confidence back up. Well, let me take you to a happier memory. Your first goal in the National Hockey League. What do you still remember about it to the day? Well, uh, original six team against uh, Detroit. Uh, I, I did it with uh, Doug Wickenheiser. Unfortunately, we lost Doug uh, uh, to cancer, uh, but a terrific guy. Alan May has gone on to do some tremendous broadcasting uh, with the Washington Capitals. He also assisted on that goal, but I remember it took me almost... I believe 15 games, if I'm not mistaken, to get that first NHL goal. And I waited so long for it. Uh, I essentially waited since I was seven years old for it. Uh, 15 games seemed like a lot of time back then, but well worth the wait. Your first fight in the National Hockey League was against one of the toughest guys who's ever played the game, a guy by the name of Joey Kosher. And again, I got to know, why would you decide to have your first fight against a guy who was that legendary? Well, there, there was a lot of guys there uh, over the years, Stephen, in terms of uh, maybe picking fights that I shouldn't have had. Uh, but I do know that I played for a guy like uh, Brian Murray, and he liked his hockey tough. But the problem was Washington always had a reputation for, for being bullied. 
Most often than not, I talk about this against the Philadelphia Flyers. We had one of the ugliest brawls in NHL history against the Flyers, over 300 penalty minutes, and it was a real, real ugly incident uh, across the board for the NHL. But I also knew how much Brian Murray loved that type of hockey. And I know I knew if I wasn't going to be an opportunity to score goals, play the power play, I wanted to stay in the lineup. I wanted to stay in the lineup more than anything. I wanted to get a hockey card, for goodness sakes. <laughs> and I knew if, if that was needed from Brian Murray and my teammates, I happily would, would do it, um, regardless of maybe risking uh, you know my health short and long term. That's how badly I wanted to stay in the lineup. You played for the Washington Capitals. You got traded to the Hartford Whalers. Once again, you got traded to the New York Rangers. Now, that's pretty cool. I want to know what it's like for a single man to be playing for the Rangers on Broadway. Yeah, it, like those reality shows, it's just, uh, <laughs> it's almost surreal. Uh, it was so much fun. And what I remember right from the, the beginning was Marc Messier, uh, true to every word they talk about him, being one of the, the greatest leaders in all of sport, welcoming me, making sure that uh, I was looked after in terms of what do you, where are you going to live? You know, what's your situation? Are you got a wife and kids? No. Okay, then come live in the city with us. It was, my, it was uh, Marc Messier, Brian Leach, Mike Richter, pretty good company within six or eight blocks on the Upper West Side. And it was so important for Mark, uh, Stephen, to, to take the whole culture in of just not being a professional athlete, but being one in New York City, which means taking it all in. Broadway shows, restaurants, the culture, the museums, everything. It was possible to take it all in and still do a great job on the ice because prior to Mark Messier, it was one or the other. They were really scared about athletes or, or hockey players being in the city and then obviously having the distractions, Mark said, no, you can, you can do both exceptionally well. There's a lovely story you tell in the book. You know, Messier won five Stanley Cups with the Edmonton Oilers. And you ask him, how come you don't wear any of your rings, your Stanley Cup rings? What did he say? Well, I'll wear mine when you can wear yours. And that was a message to me saying, I don't care what I've done in the prior. It's all about the here and now. So he didn't want uh, to wear any rings uh, in front of players that didn't have one. He wanted the next time he was going to wear one to be the new one, the present one, the one that he could control, not the ones that are in the past. And I just thought it was one of the greatest things he could say to me and, and, and to many of our, uh, his teammates that hadn't won yet that this is about the next one. It's not about the five previous. Your coach on that team was Mike Keenan, who uh, coincidentally enough, uh, got his start coaching hockey at Forest Hill Collegiate about five minutes from this studio and then University of Toronto after that. You don't have a lot of good stuff to say about Mike Keenan in this book. You, you seem to think well, he played a lot of head games no, with you guys. I, I don't think that's entirely fair, Stephen, to be quite honest with you. I just, I just want to call it the way I see it now. He was always fair to me. He never challenged me. He never um, tried to motivate me to the point where, you know, he talked down to me. But he did others, and it's 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 been noted historically over the years. When it's all said and done, Stephen, we won a championship together, and nobody could ever take uh, that away from us. And he was a good coach in so many different ways. But he had the, 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 the uh, tendency to strip guys down. I do mention that in the book with some of my teammates. Um, but it, it, if the means were, was about to, to get to a championship, then mission accomplished for him. Would I go back and change anything? Absolutely not. That's how hard of a price you have to pay to win a Stanley Cup. And and Mike was just a part of it. And you had to put up with what the ways that Mike felt were the best ways to get the most out of the New York Rangers. Some some players, it was really hard on them. Others, like me, he, he, he felt he could squeeze enough out of me and he didn't have to worry about me any longer. Others, he needed to lean on heavily. And, and that's what I wanted to bring across in the book undrafted well in fairness 1994 the rangers have not won a stanley cup since 1940 so keenan's job with messier and you and others is to finally cross that finish line which had never which hadn't been done in 54 years you had actually not been playing in that stanley cup final nick until game seven the last game <laughs> and one of the assistant coaches come up comes up to you and says okay nick you're in 
And uh, I just can't imagine what that moment must have been like. What was it like? Well, I got to play in the first round against the New York Islanders, and we remained fairly healthy, and the team was winning. And uh, like many of the black aces, and that's a term used for extra players that uh, don't get in on a regular basis, we had to buy our time. Uh, we were up in the Stanley Cup final three games to one against Vancouver, and everything seemed to be very, uh, really comfortable. And then we lost the last two games. And there was a, I wouldn't say a sense uh, of panic, but there was a, a lot of uneasiness uh, going through our team and that, or, uh, and the whole organization that we might blow this. And there just seemed to be a, a little bit of a, of a feeling from Keenan and, and the associate coach, uh, Dick Todd and, and Coley Campbell, maybe we got to just make a, a subtle change. Now, Joey Kosher was also battling a bad back. So it just seemed like a good opportunity to maybe change the energy up a little bit. And I talk about that in, in my book. And I was ready. I was absolutely ready. I was physically, mentally, emotionally ready to go back in game seven and create uh, a new energy for the guys in the room during warm up and anything I could uh, during the hockey game. So thank goodness. Thank goodness I got a chance to play in, in what is still considered the, the greatest uh, modern day uh, uh, game seven of, of hockey. You got to do something that every little kid dreams of doing and doesn't, but you did. You hoisted that Stanley Cup over your head to celebrate winning Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Finals. What was that moment like? Yeah, almost like an out-of-body experience. It's all these collective thoughts in your head going back from the very first time you, you put on skates and... You know, having uh, your, your dad watch you through the, the glass at, uh, uh, back then it was called Woodbine Arena at the Peanut Plaza. Um, it, it's just a, a revolving door of how many people it, it took to get you there. And uh, I had my dad, my sister, and my brother-in-law in, uh, in the stands. Uh, they made their way down towards me, uh, but it was very difficult. Madison Square Garden, the ice had been circled. Uh, circled with uh, police arm in arm with their riot gear on. So we had no idea what was going to happen. But the greatest thing about winning a Stanley Cup, especially in a city like New York, is sharing it with your loved ones. And then ultimately, every New York Ranger fan who had waited for 54 years. <laughs> okay, I want to get into... The, the, the parade in New York didn't last too long because you ended up getting traded again, this time to uh, your hometown team, the Toronto Maple Leafs, which was a beautiful thing. And I want to read a little excerpt from the book right now to talk about one of the more memorable nights you experienced as a member of the Leafs. Here we go. Jim Cummins, who was one of the true heavyweights at the time, breaks my nose with a roundhouse elbow. I started bleeding profusely. There was no question I was concussed, but I got back on the ice. About seven minutes later, I got into a fight with Cam Russell. Ten seconds after we left the box, there was a face-off. We lined up against each other. I took my stick and rammed it right across his head. We fought again. Now, Nick, many people would read that account and say that is a great example of everything that is wrong with hockey. Now, this is 25 years ago, admittedly, but tell me, would you, would you agree that what happened in that scenario I just described is problematic? Well, it is problematic because it's a double-edged sword for every hockey player. It's, I know my health is at risk, and I know that there's going to be uh, long-term repercussions, and it doesn't matter to me because I am in the here and now. Now, what I don't necessarily say in that book or, or what other athletes say is that that moment and that that, that character that I showed, uh, management, also earned, earned me another contract. So what do you do as, as a player? You, you want to play. You want to stay in it. You want to make as much money as you can. And you're going to do whatever it takes to show that you have the character, that, that you care enough to even want to do this. And I know it's an ongoing thing. It's a tug of war with the NHL today. Is how much do you want that, that, that warrior mentality and how much is too much? Uh, it's an ongoing dilemma that we have in professional sports, including every contact sport there is. Football goes through the same thing. How hard do you want the linebackers to charge the, the quarterback? 
you still want that element that that it, it sells Stephen. that is a part of the sales job on what you love about contact sports the fan still wants to sit on the other side of the plexiglass wondering do i have the guts to do what he's doing that's part of the sale. No, I appreciate that. And uh, Don Cherry's got a line which says, nobody ever goes to the snack bar in the middle of a fight. There's no question about that. I did actually, before picking up the book, before starting to read the book, I was, I was asking myself, I wonder if he's going to talk about the Grand Fuhrer incident. And, and you do. You do go into it in great detail. So I want to do some of that with you right now. Because one of the most controversial moments of your career was a time when you're playing against the St. Louis Blues, and you get cross-checked by a guy who's a lot bigger than you, actually into Grant Fuhr. We're looking at the video of it now. There's P Chris Pronger cross-checking you into Grant Fuhr. You land on him. It wrecks his knee, and he is out for the year. And it was a tough year for the Blues to lose their great goalie because they were real Stanley Cup contenders at that time. Your old coach in New York, Mike Keenan, who's now the coach of the St. Louis Blues, accuses you after the game of deliberately trying to injure Grant Fuhr. I guess my question is, do you get sick and tired of trying to explain to people that Look, this was just an accident in hockey, and I didn't go out there trying to hurt anybody. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna carry that, you know, till the day they put me six feet under, and the Blues fans will forever hate me. I thought maybe they, they could it would die down a little bit with their championship, but no, they're still on me 24, uh, 25 years later on that incident, and I, I just, I, I it's it's no different than how I explained it. It was a hockey play. Could I have avoided uh, Grant Fear? Yes, I could have. But when, when a guy cross-checks you and you're on top of the goalie, uh, it, it's to fall on him. Did I, try to, did I try to disrupt their team? Did I try to get Chris Pronger to take a penalty? Did I try to bother Grant Fear? Yes, 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 and yes. Did I try to injure him? Did I, would, I, would I have liked to have seen him limp off the ice and, and be in surgery? you know, a week or two weeks later. No, absolutely not. It's a play that I've done uh, countless times during my career at all levels. Never have I seen uh, a situation where a guy's knee's been taken out. That was the first one. I felt horrible. I still do. Grant Fear is a complete gentleman. I talk about um, coming to uh, a meeting with him uh, years after, thanks to Mark Messier in the book, just to go show you what a, what a class guy he is. But I still feel terrible to this day, knowing that uh, uh, he he hurt his knee and needed surgery. I, I still get knots in my stomach thinking about it. Hmm. Well, if you get knots in your stomach thinking about that, you're probably not going to much like the next thing I'm about to show you because this is, as we alluded to in the introduction, uh, the, the way your career ended was one of the most shocking things I've ever seen. And I've seen a few games in my time. You and Ryan Vandebush, you're now with the Leafs. He's with the New York Rangers. The game is at Madison Square Garden. There is a moment where this fight could have ended. The linesman comes up to you and says, essentially, Kipper, you had enough, and you want to keep going. And as we roll the video of this fight, I'm going to read an excerpt from your book and how you describe it. I held out for one more chance to throw a knockout punch. It was a career-altering mistake. Ryan caught me with two successive punches. The first grazed my right shoulder, but the second was square to my cheekbone. And here it comes if you're watching the video. How I escaped with half of my face not caving in, I'll never know. And we stopped the video here, Nick, before the blood really gets bad because there may be young people watching this. I had passed out while I was standing. I collapsed, falling forward. I was unconscious without the ability to break my fall. My forehead hit the ice full force. I started to bleed all over the ice. That was the last night I tied the skates. Nick, when was the first time you got to watch the video of that fight? It was off of a media request uh, out of New York. And I had I'd been called in, uh, countless times, and I always said no, no, no. But I knew eventually uh, none of this would go away until they had something in terms of uh, my take on, on a lot of what transpired. And, of course, it was an era... Stephen, when so much was around uh, violence and concussions all over again, and we had just gone through a, a scenario with Lindros and Pat LaFontaine and those guys battling hard. So it was, um, it was important for me now to kind of start thinking about 
um, an early start of closure. Of course, I, I never really got it uh, on a three-minute interview, um, but I needed to go back there and start dealing with it again. And, you know, if I, if I look at that first interview uh, back in uh, 97, 98, then I speak of meeting Ryan Vandenbush on, um, on a Sportsnet series we did, uh, uh, Crisis on Ice, and then actually speaking about it in great detail in my book that just got released on October 20th, it probably took me a good 25 years to put full, complete closure on it because it was, it was a very traumatic thing that happened to me. And there's always a fork in the road and it was important to me that I picked the right decisions after that so I could lead a productive life. And it was calculated on my part, and I got lucky a lot in terms of the decisions that I made after that. But so far, so good. I know a lot of players, ex-players, that even don't, ha don't take on a traumatic injury like that that have not fared well in post career well hold on and they have ne trouble never mind post political uh, never mind post uh, playing life i want to i want to keep you on that fight for a second there because when you saw yeah. that video i wonder if there was a part of yourself that asked yourself holy smokes i could have died there yeah that was probably later on uh i had that feeling again um uh with with ryan with ryan vandenbush on the set of sportsnet but to be completely honest, it wasn't, I asked that question, not on me, but if I would have died, how Ryan would have dealt with it. And, you know, he spoke in great detail about how that event affected him moving forward. So there's a lot of dominoes in play here uh, when it comes to how that type of injury affects a lot of people moving forward. But it took me quite a long time to really put it in its proper place, and I think I concluded that in the book. When the linesman had that moment in the midst of the fight where you might have been able to sort of stop it, have them intervene, and the crushing blow never would have happened, why did you, why did you uh, slough him off and prevent him from breaking up the fight? Yeah. Because I wanted more. I got greedy. I, I, I wanted to be in a position where people would say, ah, you know what, he, he held on. I, I wanted the knockout punch. I wanted what he had, a decisive victory where I can go back to my bench and say, hey, I can do this. I can still be a, a, a guy that looks after, you know, the, the Matt Sundins of the world and uh, the Dave Ellett's and the Kirk Mullers. I, I can do all that. Uh, but it, it just, it never came to be. And you know, I'm, there's certain times in my life and certain times in the book where you just have to go for it, that you have to put it all on the line. I did it there. Uh, Pat DeBuzo, the, the linesman, was kind enough to come in, and uh, I, I shook him off, and that's, that's just the part of my history. I can live with it now. You can live with it now, but, but I'm going to ask you to sort of uh, reanalyze it a little bit more because had you accepted the, referee, the linesman's advice and broken up the fight at that moment. You'd have no doubt played several more years. You'd have made several million more dollars playing professional hockey. Do you, do you look back at it and say, holy cow, that was the worst decision I ever made in my life? No, no, I look back at it and say it's the best decision of my life because life is about uh, making the most out of opportunities. Without that incident, I don't get a, an analyst job at Sportsnet. I don't get a chance to be one of the first people uh, that goes on a hockey show in 1998 and, and last 21 years. I am convinced, without the sequence, sequence of events that happened in my life, this doesn't happen, this doesn't happen, and this doesn't happen. And quite possibly, this interview right now doesn't happen. <laughs> I'm, I'm really, really happy and content with everything that's happened my last uh, 21, 22 years since that incident. Okay, fair enough. But but then um, let me ask you something that you actually uh, uh, you might be you might have one paragraph in the book about this, and that's it. So I do want to ask you about it here. Fighting in the National Hockey League. Now, all of what just transpired to you, we're talking a quarter century ago. Let's go to today. Do you think, with the players being as big as they are now, and with the game being as fast as it is right now? Is there still a place for hockey, uh, for fighting in the National Hockey League? 
not anywhere near to the extent that we had it. And, you know, the one thing that I do like about it, it, it seems to be evolving naturally and it, it's not forced in any way. Ultimately, the gatekeepers of this game aren't the owners. Yes, financially, we know what that they mean to the game. But the ones truly are the gatekeepers are the ones that play it. And their voice in 2020 has been heard. And that's they still want to keep fighting in the game. But the numbers are way down, Stephen. They don't even fight remotely uh, close to what we did. I think I think there's over 70% uh, of the games now in the NHL that have no fighting in them. Think about that. That is a huge number. But for those that feel like they still need it, at least it's there for them. If they if they feel like it warrants um, uh, a, an opportunity to do that and diffuse uh, emotion. So in five years, it could be out altogether. But if it is, it's because the players choose that. And, and that, I think, is is the best way to progress from here on end. Okay, let's finish up on this, Nick. You're, I think, what, 54 years old now? I am, yes. 54, okay. Yeah, still a, still an awfully pretty do, do guy, I, I got to say. No, you look damn good for, <laughs> for 54 and a guy who's been through, and I'm going to list it here, five root canals, a three-inch screw in your shoulder, a reconstructed right knee, a spinal fracture in your right leg, spiral fracture, excuse me, too many stitches yes. to count, and, of course, that career-ending concussion that we just talked about. So the last question is, how do you feel today? Yeah. I, some days are great and others you, you, you got some challenges. Um, but uh, overall, I, I think I still got out at age 32, which is relatively young today. And like you said, I could have gone on for two or three more years, maybe made another million, $2 million. But I'm also, I, I think I benefit today at 54 years of age of only playing you know, 450 games, 500 if you include some playoff games, and and not 1,000 or 1,100 or 1,200 games. I think, you know, it's a remarkable feat to play over 1,000 games, and we know not many guys do it. But we also know that there's a price to be paid for 1,000 games. And I feel like I got out early enough where I could have those challenges of, of some days not being as great as others, but for the most part, still feeling really, really good. I I ran the New York Marathon <laughs> when I was 47 years old after all those injuries. And that, to me, is, is a, a big of a compliment, uh, accomplishment that I had as any, including winning the Stanley Cup in, in a different way. So I, I think I got out early enough, Stephen, where I could still be a productive uh, uh, adult uh, in, in my latter part. If I'm, to use a golf phrase, if I'm on the back 18 of my life, so far, so good. That's great. I really enjoyed the book, Nick. Uh, Doug McLean, whom you work with, has the foreword in the book. It's called Undrafted, and we're really glad it's brought you to our, sort of to our studios at TVO, virtually anyway, uh, on this evening. Take good care, and thanks so much. Stephen, a big fan of you and, and what you do uh, uh, on your show. Uh, thanks for having me. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.